Hey guys, Tim from VP Machine. The topic of today's video is going to be coolant and carbide and um, basically why I don't use coolant when milling with carbide uh, tools. Now this is going to apply um, spe specifically to steel. Um, anything from mild steel up to tool steels that are 45 Rockwell. Um, I never use coolant. And what you see in front of you here is two half inch end mills. The one on the left is a uh, aluminum titanium nitride coated end mill. And this is also a variable helix or variable flute geometry end mill. And that variable flute geometry basically helps the, keep the end mill from chattering. Um, basically each flute is a slightly different geometry so that you're not going in with the same uh, flute at the same geometry. Um, so as one hits, the next one will be slightly different and it helps eliminate chatter. And the one we have on the right here, the coating is TIALN or titanium aluminum nitride. And it's a similar coating. The one on the right um, was actually developed in the late 1980s and the Aluminum titanium nitrite was developed in the early 1990s, and they both are designed um, basically to both withstand a, a high amount of heat. Um, one on the left, 1,250 degrees Fahrenheit. One on the right, right around 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And they actually activate, um, when they get up to these high temperatures, it activates the coating. And they become super slippery on the coating and it lubricates the cut and helps the chips fly off and doesn't produce a lot of heat on your workpiece. Um, if you use coolant on these, it basically causes a thermal shocking condition. And this is the case with um, inserted cutters as well. Uh, many manufacturers do not recommend, especially when roughing, that base mills and shoulder mills that you use coolant with them. Um, also the same with the fly cutters. Um, we recommend that you never use coolant on any material with this, but with most, uh, most steels, um, you don't want to use coolant for milling. And we're going to go over the machine and then I'll do a little demonstration and explain it a little further. Okay, we're over at the machine now, and I've got a piece of 2 inch by 2 inch by approximately 9 and a quarter inch long. Um, I believe it's cold rolled, I'm not sure. Um, it looks like a, a seasoned piece of cold rolled from our scrap rack, but uh, I'm going to be taking a 1 inch deep by 3 quarter inch uh, chunk out of the front of this, basically a shelf, just to show you uh, how this cuts dry. And you know, many people think that the workplace is, or the workpiece is going to get extremely hot if you're dry milling. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to do a temperature measurement before cutting. Right now we're at 62.4 degrees, it's a little chilly in here. But uh, this metal in here takes a long time to warm up. And uh, I'm going to be running it at uh, 6,600 RPM. So we're going to take the full depth of cut. And we're going to be doing uh, kind of a conservative cut, 25 thou passes. And uh, we'll look at the chip and see what the chip comes out looking like. And that kind of tells you uh, whether you're doing it right or not. So here we go. First pass is going to be uh, just a dry run. I'm adjusting the feed and speed as we go. Uh, 
halfway there um, I'm going to show you what the temperature is of the material so we're at about uh, at the warmest point about 120 degrees or so so it's not getting hot enough to really do anything to change the material Okay, let's take a look at our temperature. And you can see as it goes back, it's pretty much a few degrees warmer than when we started. Now the end mill temperature, probably going to be quite cool by now, but see if I can hit it. They're both actually not too bad. Now that the chips, um, this is basically where the heat went. It was in the chips, they're slightly yellowed. And when you see them like that, uh, it means you can be a little more aggressive. You can actually go higher RPMs. They, they can start to turn blue, and that's kind of how you want it, with a little bit blue. So I could have been more aggressive with that. Now, if you're worried about the few degrees uh, temperature change um, in that block, you could do the other operations. Let's say this piece had drilling um, holes and tapping holes involved. You could do that, and obviously you'd be using flood coolant, and that would cool off the part. But I left uh, 10 thousandths on the, the walls on this, and uh, you could easily go back in there and just finish that. Um, the end mill that I... The end mill brand that I'm using, um, these are both, both of the end mills that I've showed you are from a company called Sharp Carbide, and they're a local company. I'm not being sponsored by them, but their website is sharpcarbide.com, and uh, I was just over there picking up some end mills and uh, told them I was going to do a video with their end mills, and they said, yeah, uh, if they're interested in ordering, call us, and we'll give a discount on their first order, so... I'll have a link below in the description, and uh, obviously you can go to their website and check it out. But uh, the problem with using flood coolant is that the coating on that end mill runs so hot, and that's what pr provides the lubrication for it. So every time that tool goes down and makes contact with the part, it heats up again. And uh, if you had coolant, flood coolant on that end mill as it was cutting, it would experience thermal shock every time it hit the part, and then it would rapidly cool the end mill as it's rapid tra traversing back across the part to take the next cut. 
but you've got that thermal cycling that is not good at all for a carbide end mill. If you picture a carbide end mill like a piece of glass, um, or like a glass bottle, I should say, um, and you put that glass bottle in the refrigerator and then uh, put it in a, um, a pan of boiling water, it's going to shatter the glass. And that's what winds up killing end mills is the thermal cycling or the it basically fractures the sharp points until it's end, the end mill is worn out. Now this uh, um, little shelf that we just did, that one end mill could likely do 500 of these parts no problem and uh, and still be usable. And um, the coolant is absolutely unnecessary and has no function. So, and the same is true for inserted tools um, it, it, the thermal shock will do the exact same thing now you want to watch your coating on uncoated inserts um, that might be a, a gray area but on most of the modern coated inserts um, most manufacturers recommend that when you're roughing you do not use coolant now another thing that uh, can kill end mill life is uh, recutting the chips and you may be saying uh, what if I was doing a slot or a pocket and I had to evacuate the chips out of it um, what I use and I installed this on this machine uh, years ago is air blow and whenever I'm doing something I can just hit the button on the control or program it right into the program and activate the air blow and that basically is just a uh, an adjustable bar that I made for the machine and some mounts and then a quarter inch airline that uh, runs to a solenoid in the back and then I have on the control um, Fidel has a coolant 2 and if I'm calling that up uh, that coolant 2 in a program it was just it would just be referred to as mist and then I have an air regulator on the side here where I can adjust the airflow and in the back of the machine where the solenoid is, it's just a 110 volt uh, solenoid that activates the air blow. And that effectively gets the chips out of your way um, so you're not recutting them. And this is what that solenoid looks like. And that basically just goes, uh, <clears throat> it's wired into the 110 volt outlet that's activated on the back that would be normally for a coolant pump. There's two of them. One is connected to the coolant pump and that's coolant one. And then coolant two just activates this air blow. So well, that'll pretty much do it for this video. I think I've uh, covered everything on, on that topic that I wanted to, but uh, if you guys have any questions or uh, I always enjoy seeing your comments, leave some comments down below and, uh, Thanks again for watching. Um, I'm going to have some pictures here that will uh, pretty much back up my, uh, my theories on dry milling. And uh, we'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.